Hello everyone and welcome back to SFF 180 and look what I've dragged out of storage and dusted off. The old Daily Shorts is back, although now it's called Short Takes. I mean, let's be honest, <laughs> there was there was never exactly a daily part to it, but this is the first video of a two-part episode in which I'm reviewing all of the nominees in the short story categories for both this year's Hugo and Nebula Awards. Now, because of COVID-19, both Worldcon and the Nebula Conference are going to be virtual events. The Nebula Awards will be announced online May the 30th, and the Hugos, I, I guess, at the beginning of August, when the original ceremony was meant to take place in New Zealand. Yeah, just gonna be sad for a second that trip's not happening now. There are nine stories total between the two shortlists, and for this first episode, I will talk about five of them, starting with the three stories that overlap both ballots. All of these stories can be read online. It's looking more and more like the poor print magazines just can't catch a break anymore. So I will link all of them in the description below for you to read them yourselves. Interestingly, the first two I'm going to talk about are both horror stories, although very unconventional in how they approach the horror genre. Both of them are also interesting for how they address similar themes of colonialism and the impact of cultural assimilation, as well as offering two very different revenge scenarios. And Now His Lordship is Laughing is a chilling fantasy horror tale by Indian author Shiv Ramdas, set against the Bengal famine of 1943, a devastating blight that killed up to three million people that was caused in part by Britain's scorched earth policies designed to deny food and transport to any potential Japanese invaders. Our protagonist is Appa, an elderly doll maker who responds to colonialist brutality with the one power she has. Now, to get the full harrowing effect of this story, it's best to go in with an absolute bare minimum of a plot synopsis, but it's elegantly written, and I can honestly say the final scene is worthy of Edgar Allan Poe. Now, one thing that made last year's short story finalists kind of disappointing for me was that some of them were so focused on being formal experiments that form ended up overwhelming content. Playing with narrative form while also delivering a real story is a hat trick, but it's one that has been pulled off impressively by excerpts from an annotated bibliography on the cannibal women of Ratnabar Island. This story is also by a Bengali author, Nibidita Sen, who is part of the Glittership podcast. What Sen manages to pull off in barely 1,400 words that take the form of 10 single-paragraph excerpts from fictional historical writings is impressive enough that you may need to read the whole thing twice before its effect actually sinks in. It begins with an account of the discovery of a hunter-gatherer tribe on one of the Andaman Islands. The tribe consists mostly of women and children, and they practice a ritual cannibalism that, according to rumor, gives them some kind of special powers. The story goes on to account what happened when one girl from the tribe was brought back to England and enrolled in a girl's school. We eventually end up with writings by that girl's descendants. Somehow, Nibidi to Sen manages to work in a queer romance, although one that takes a dark turn, plus commentary on cultural displacement and alienation, uh, the roles assigned to women by society, and a quick slap across the face of white feminism. And she does it in a story that takes less time to read than it will take to watch this video. Good job. The next story was something of a letdown for me. Fran Wilde's A Catalog of Storms has an original and imaginative premise and pretty writing, but it doesn't add up to a satisfying story. Sela is the youngest of three daughters, living in a coastal town besieged by all kinds of sentient storms. Local citizens have discovered, kind of by accident, the magic that helps them fight off the storms. Though in the process of doing this, they have to become weathermen, who must leave their families and eventually transform into weather themselves. Sela, her sister Varel, and their mother must deal with the personal anguish of having her oldest sister, Lilith, join the weathermen. As I said, it's a cool idea, and Fran Wilde's prose is lovely and evocative, but the structure is much too fragmented so that it reads like a choppy series of scenes in search of a coherent story. As the narrator and protagonist, Sela is too passive. She doesn't do much of anything, and so the story lacks the necessary tension to hold your interest. Now, the next two stories are exclusively on the Nebula ballot. 
Karen Osborne's The Dead in Their Uncontrollable Power is set on a generation ship where the captains are basically hereditary kings, and a religious culture has been put in place to enforce loyalty and compliance. Every successor to the captain has all of the memories of previous captains installed via nanobots, but only the good memories that perpetuate a heroic narrative. Bad memories of evil deeds are consumed by a sin eater drawn out from the lower classes in steerage. The story involves the newest sin eater and the newest captain coming together after a bombing at the beginning of the story in order to right generations of past wrongs. I liked how the story delved into the notion of rulers so desperate to cling to power that they will commit the most selfish acts of betrayal for their own benefit. It's a theme that really resonates in the world right now, to be honest. But what makes this story absorbing is also what makes it cry out for more length to develop its world building. I just wanted to know so much more about the vast history of this ship and its people. Well, at least we're getting Karen Osborne's debut novel soon, so I'm excited for that. H.E. Greenblatt's Give the Family My Love is a quietly moving little elegy for a dying Earth, and the hope that science, matched with humanism, can offer us even in the bleakest times. Dr. Hazel Smith is an environmental researcher who is granted sole access to a vast library containing intergalactic knowledge run by a race of aliens called the Archivists, who have recently made first contact with humanity. Hazel hopes that she can find research to reverse climate disaster on Earth, which is on the verge of a complete death spiral. But she has to confront her own cynicism into the bargain. Now, while there are some details that I could nitpick, such as why the key to saving humanity is only to be found in the lost research of a single scientist? As a piece of Anthropocene science fiction all about finding hope in a darkened heart, I'd say, yeah, it pushes the right buttons. So, tomorrow morning I will be back with the second part of this video, covering the remaining four story nominees, some of which are written by some heavy hitters among SFF's emerging talents, so don't miss that. And then later in the week, expect new book reviews at long last. Yay! All right, you know the drill. If you enjoyed watching, please hit that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe if you haven't done so yet. That is how the channel grows. You can also support the channel at my Tee Public store and at my Patreon, where recruits into Wink's Army get little perks like getting to see some of my videos early access, <laughs> except perhaps when my sleep cycle is completely knocked out of whack because I'm quarantining. Sorry about that. But I do want to thank all of those folks for their additional support. It is extremely helpful in paying my channel artist, Matt Olson, for all of his lovely thumbnails. I want to thank all the rest of you for being the very best viewers in all of BookTube, and until I see all of you next time, stay safe and healthy, and happy reading. <laughs>